Hello, everybody. Welcome to QPL. Uh, after three years, we're back in person. We couldn't even remember anymore which one it was three years ago. Who knows? Orange, indeed. That we found it out. Yeah, orange. Anyway, okay, and okay, now you hear me. Anyway, I want to welcome you on behalf of the steering committee of QPL. I want to welcome you on behalf of Wolfson College, where I'm an emeritus fellow. And oh, oh, father. Okay, and and I want to welcome you on behalf of Continuum, which is where many of us now move to also known formerly as Cambridge Quantum. Give to Stefano. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Stefano Gojoso. I am one of the chairs for QPL 2022. Thank you very much for coming here in person. It's great to see everybody uh, again physically after a couple of years of hiatus. Um, this is, this is going to be a fairly big and busy conference. We had more than 140 submissions. We're going to have five full days starting Wednesday. We're going to even have to have parallel sessions because that's just how many talks we have. This first session, however, is going to be a plenary talk. Uh, it's going to be a talk on causality. I believe it's going to be given by, is it Julian or Cyril that gives it? Oh, it's... oh okay. Then. Well, welcome from the University of Oxford, uh, on behalf of the University of Oxford, and I hope that we will have a fantastic time together this week. So thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity to give this talk here. I will present this work on the existence of processes violating causal inequalities on time delocalized subsystems. So this joint work with uh, Cyril Bronciard and uh, Ognian Oreshkov which you can also find on the archive under uh, the identifier shown here. So first of all, let me give a small introduction about uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so our usual understanding of causality is that the events in the world around us are embedded into a definite causal order. But uh, in recent years, there has been a lot of uh, interest in the question what happens when quantum theory comes into play and what uh, implications does uh, quantum theory have for our understanding of causality. So if you look at the conference program, there are a couple of talks on quantum causality and there are uh, various uh, different approaches to, to this question. And uh, one particular framework to study quantum causal relations is the process matrix formalism. So. This is a framework where one assumes local quantum operations, but one does not assume any a priori global causal structure between them. And uh, then in this framework, one finds that there are indeed situations that are not compatible with any well-defined causal order between the operations. A central open question in this uh, line of research is whether this phenomenon of indefinite causal order is physically realizable. Whether one can do an experiment that's uh, causally indefinite or whether one can observe this somehow. And uh, it is believed that some processes with indefinite causal order have a physical realization in standard quantum series. So there are indeed uh, lab experiments that have been done on that. And uh, But there has been some controversy about whether uh, this can really be seen as indefinite causal order or not. And a rigorous framework to clarify in what sense uh, it can be seen as uh, realizations of indefinite causal order is this uh, approach of time delocalized systems uh, introduced by Ognjan Oreshkov. And uh, the result uh, that I'm going to present in this talk is that uh, there exist certain processes that are uh, uh, in uh, in conflict with causality in some in, in a particularly uh, extreme way, namely they violate so-called causal inequalities, and that uh, have realizations in this sense, so on time delocalized systems. So here's the outline of my talk. First, I will. Uh, briefly summarize this process matrix framework. Then uh, I will uh, say a few general things about this uh, approach of uh, time delocalized systems. Then I will present the 
main result and uh, discuss some applications of uh, some some implications of that. So uh, first of all, let's uh, look at this process matrix framework work, which we use to describe causal relations in quantum theory. So the starting point is that one assumes two parties, uh, Alice and Bob, or more parties, uh, which reside in local laboratories and which perform quantum operations. So that means uh, they have some incoming and outgoing quantum systems. And uh, the, the most general quantum operation that they can perform is the so-called quantum instrument. So a quantum instrument is a uh, an operation that has both a classical output or a measurement outcome and a, a quantum output. And uh, technically, it's a, a, a set of uh, CP maps that sum up to a CP map, so to a completely positive and uh, trace preserving uh, map. And uh, so uh, the point of, of the process matrix framework is that one assumes those uh, parties that perform their local operations, but one does not assume any a priori global causal structure into which uh, these parties are embedded. And now the question that one considers is what uh, are the most general correlations that the parties can establish in such, such a situation? And uh, one finds that the most general correlations are given by such a generalized Born rule here where uh, the uh, MA and uh, MB are the uh, local operations that uh, the parties perform. So uh, technically, these are the joy representations of, uh, of, of their maps. And uh, this W is a Hermitian matrix called the process matrix, which is the central uh, object of this process matrix framework, and which can be seen as the environment or the physical resource that relates to local operations. So it's, uh, if one draws this, it's uh, kind of a, a, a circuit with a cycle where uh, one has the uh, two operations performed by the parties and their output is fed into the process matrix and they receive some input from the process matrix. And so they are composed together with the process matrix in a cyclic circuit. And uh, the only constraint that one Im imposes here is that one uh, wants this uh, generalized Born rule to uh, yield valid probabilities. So that uh, implies certain constraints for the process matrix. Process matrix must be positive semi-definite. It must be in some uh, particular uh, linear subspace of uh, Hermitian matrices, and it uh, must satisfy a normalization condition. And uh, any process matrix that uh, satisfies these constraints describes some uh, some possible way in uh, in which the parties uh, Alice and Bob can be related. So, what uh, what kind of situations can one describe in uh, in this framework? So, a process matrix can, for instance, describe a situation where a, a, a bipartite state is shared between Alice and Bob, so uh, each of them receives one part of a, a bipartite state and performs a measurement on it. In that case, the process matrix would just be the, uh, the density matrix of the state, and uh, the uh, local operations would be TOVMs. But uh, in this process matrix framework, we can also describe more generally situations where there is signaling between the parties. So for instance, a process matrix could also describe a situation where uh, Alice's local operation is to prepare a state. Then uh, she sends the state through a channel to Bob who measures it as his uh, local operations. So uh, if you want a process matrix can be understood as some generalization of a density matrix, which also allows to, uh, to, to describe scenarios where there's signaling. And uh, then one can one can ask the question: What uh, is the most general possibility that one can have, where uh, where one still has uh, some definite causal order between the parties? And uh, here it uh, it can be shown that uh, any process matrix 
which does not allow Bob to signal to Alice. So for which the correlations are such that Bob cannot signal to Alice corresponds to a standard quantum circuit where Alice acts before Bob. So some uh, some circuit uh, like you see here, where Alice acts on some part of an entangled state and they uh, then uh, sends their output through, through a channel to Bob. And conversely, any process matrix that does not uh, allow Alice to signal to Bob simply corresponds to a standard quantum circuit where Bob acts before Alice. And then one can also uh, consider probabilistic mixtures of the two cases. So one can uh, flip a coin and uh, then perform a, either a process with uh, A before B or one with uh, B before A. And so that's the most general situation that is still compatible with a well-defined causal order between uh, Alice and Bob. And any process matrix that satisfies this, that can be written in this way, is called causally separable. And now uh, the, uh, the finding that is uh, at the heart of this whole uh, research line on uh, indefinite causal order is that there exist process matrices that are not causally separable. So uh, via this uh, top-down approach, one finds that uh, there are indeed situations where the parties are related in a way that is incompatible with the well-defined causal order. And furthermore, some causally non-separable process matrices uh, exhibit some particularly uh, extreme form of uh, non-causality, namely uh, when one looks at the correlations that they generate uh, via this generalized Born rule, uh, they cannot be decomposed as a convex sum of a correlation with uh, A before B and one with B before A. And uh, these kind of correlations violate so-called causal inequalities. So uh, these are uh, analogs of Bell inequalities uh, for these uh, for, for this situation, which uh, certify the incompatibility with a definite causal order in a device-independent way. So that was a short introduction into this uh, process matrix framework and uh, how it uh, describes uh, scenarios with uh, indefinite causal order. And now uh, let's talk about uh, this, the possibility of physically realizing such uh, situations and more particularly this uh, approach of time delocalized systems. So one uh, central question in, in this field on indefinite causal order is whether this phenomenon of indefinite causal order has some kind of physical realization. So, uh, this, is there, so uh, this, this, uh, this process matrix framework is some top-down approach where one just imposes some very general constraints and it is not known whether all process matrices correspond to something that is physical or that could be realized in the lab. So that is uh, one, one central question is to determine uh, in particular for those process matrices that are causally indefinite, whether they can be realized or not. And uh, one uh, possibility that uh, has also motivated this whole field of research is that uh, the, there could possibly be scenarios at the interface of quantum theory and gravity where one finds indefinite causal order. So uh, for instance, something like a superposition of space-time geometries, which leads to a superposition of causal relations or something like that. And, uh, but uh, there have also been uh, optical laboratory experiments in standard quantum theory, which have been performed in order to demonstrate indefinite causal order. So there has been a, a whole bunch of uh, quite sophisticated experiments that have been performed. But these uh, experiments have been uh, accompanied by uh, uh, some, some debate on uh, whether uh, they can uh, indeed be considered realizations of indefinite causal order or whether they should uh, merely be considered some kind of simulations of indefinite causal order. Because after all, uh, in, uh, in quantum theory, you have a definite background time according to which everything evolves. So one uh, may ask the question, how uh, is it possible that one could have indefinite causal order between quantum operations in, uh, in standard quantum theory. So uh, 
one particular process that has been uh, studied in uh, in this context, which is the most uh, maybe the uh, most well known example of a process with uh, indefinite causal order, is the so called quantum switch. So the quantum switch is a protocol where two quantum operations are applied to uh, some target system in a superposition of orders. So one has some control qubit, which uh, if it is in state zero, uh, uh, A is applied before B on the target system. And if it is in state one, B is applied before A on the target system. So if this control system is in a superposition, one has a superposition of the two uh, orders of the operations A and B. And this uh, protocol can indeed be described in terms of a four uh so so in in terms of a, of a process matrix that is causally uh, non separable so it uh, it uh, it it can be fit into this uh, this framework of uh, of process matrices and uh, then one uh, one can describe it by a, a causally non separable process matrix that is four partite so one has an additional party in the in the past and the future which uh, prepares or measures the, the target systems and uh, control systems, respectively. And uh, this uh, process matrix would generate the same correlations as the, the quantum switch. Now, uh, the, the type of experiments that have been performed to, uh, to, to implement this quantum switch in the lab are, for instance, uh, some interferometric metric experiments of the type shown here, where one has uh, two polarizing beam splitters, which uh, can trans which which would uh, transmit or reflect a photon, depending on its polarization. So if it is uh, horizontally polarized, it would be transmitted by those polarizing beam splitters. So it would first go to A, and then to B. And when it is uh, reflected by those polarizing beam splitters, it would first go to, to B, uh, and then to A. And uh, so now the question is whether uh, such that, that type of experiments can be considered a genuine uh, realization of uh, of this process with indefinite causal order or not? Because when uh, when one would describe this uh, experiment from a, a temporal perspective, so if one would uh, draw a quantum circuit for for that, it would rather look like that. So one would have uh, two instances where. Uh, to where the two uh, operations are applied in a coherently controlled way at uh, at either uh, T1 or uh, T2 on the target system. While uh, the, the picture that one has in the process matrix framework looks quite different. So in the process matrix framework, one has one instance of uh, each operation which acts on some well-defined input and output system and which is related to the process matrix. And uh, so uh, the, the relation between the two pictures is, uh, is a priori unclear. So it is, uh, it is not so clear why the uh, thing on the left should be, uh, the, the, the thing on the right should be considered a realization of the uh, thing on the left, which describes the, uh, the situation in the process matrix picture. And uh, this uh, approach of time delocalized systems uh, answer uh, is uh, provides a, a possibility to uh, to answer this question and to to link these two perspectives. So it uh, provides a, a link between the temporal description of uh, of such experiments and the process matrix picture. And namely, uh, this link is that uh, the process matrix description can be seen as a different description of the same experiments in terms of different systems, namely so-called uh, time delocalized systems. So uh, let me say what uh, what this means, what one understands uh, in general by uh, by a time delocalized system. So uh, in quantum theory, we can uh, describe uh, quantum uh, time uh, evolution by uh, by quantum circuits. So uh, in a quantum circuit, we have operations that act on systems at uh, well-defined times. And then uh, 
we can uh, we can say that we consider uh, fragments of the circuit. So, for uh, for instance, for this uh, so example of a circuit that is shown here, we can uh, divide it into two fragments, like the uh, red and blue fragments that you see uh, in the picture on the button. And then uh, these fragments uh, are themselves quantum operations that act on systems which are associated with multiple times. So for instance, the red fragment would be an, uh, an operation from the systems AF to the outgoing systems DHI. And uh, conversely, the complementary blue fragment would be an operation which goes from DHI to AF. So the quantum circuit can be seen as a, a composition of two uh, of these two uh, operations, which are composed in a cyclic way. So the um, incoming system of the red fragment or the outgoing system of the blue fragment and vice versa. And now uh, what one means by a time delocalized systems description of the uh, of, of such a circuit uh, is that uh, one uh, composes these fragments uh, not over the uh, systems that we saw originally in the circuit but over some new choice of systems and uh, so uh, if I generally choose some some new systems to compose them, these systems will no longer be associated with a definite time. And that is what one understands by a time delocalized system. So generally, if I want to describe this red fragment in terms of some new systems, I would compose it with some isomorphisms, which define some uh, new uh, tensor product structure on the joint incoming and outgoing Hilbert spaces. And that would give rise to a description of this uh, operation corresponding to the red fragment in terms of new systems. And uh, to uh, to recompose them, the blue fragment also needs to be uh, composed with the inverses of uh, of these isomorphisms, and then I can compose the two operations over those new systems, and uh, I get a description of the same circuit, but in terms of new quantum systems. And uh, that uh, that general concept can now be invoked to. Uh, to make the link of the temporal description of the quantum circuit of the quantum switch and the process matrix picture. So for the quantum switch, one can uh, one can introduce such uh, time delocalized systems. One can decompose it into two fragments, then uh, compose uh, each fragment with uh, isomorphisms and for the blue fragments, the inverses of the isomorphisms respectively, in order to uh, to describe uh, these uh, fragments in terms of the uh, new uh, subsystem decomposition. And then when one uh, recomposes the uh, fragments in the new description, one obtains a cyclic circuit, which looks precisely like the circuit one has in the process matrix picture. So one has a cyclic circuit where uh, one has uh, one instance of each operation uh, a and B, which acts on those new time delocalized systems that we defined, and some uh, process matrix box, so to say, which takes the outputs of these quantum uh, operations uh, performed by uh, A and B uh, back to the inputs. And uh, so, so when uh, when one describes the temporal description of the quantum switch in terms of uh, these new subsystems. One obtains precisely the structure one has in the process matrix framework. So that, that's that's the idea how uh, these time delocalized systems justify uh, the the link between the temporal description and the uh, uh, process matrix description. So that's how it uh, works for the quantum switch. And uh, now one may wonder uh, whether uh, there are other processes that have realizations in the sense on uh, on time delocalized systems. And uh, a similar arguments works for more general processes where uh, the times of operations are coherently controlled. So one can consider more complex situations than uh, the quantum switch where one has more operations or uh, dynamical causal order, for instance. 
and uh, this also for this one can also identify suitable time delocalized systems on which they can be set to be realized but this cannot uh, violate causal inequalities so this has been shown uh, in these two uh, works here and then uh, one can also uh, consider a more general class uh, of which the quantum switch is an example namely uh, unitary extensions of bipartite processes so basically that means that uh, uh, this process matrix box is a uh, is a unitary with some additional uh, global past and uh, future system and uh, all uh, pro process processes in this class uh, also have realizations on time delocalized systems but uh, in uh, some subsequent uh, works, it has then been shown that uh, all unitary extensions of bipartite processes are some variations of the quantum switch. So uh, they uh, basically can all be realized by something similar uh, as the quantum switch, where the uh, operations are applied in a coherently controlled way with some operations in between. And so they also cannot violate causal inequalities. So uh, now uh, we, we come to the main result. Uh, and uh, namely, uh, we have shown that uh, there, there exist some processes that uh, violate causal inequalities and that have realizations on time delocalized systems. And uh, so the, uh, the main technical result uh, that we, uh, we show uh, in this work is that uh, unitary extensions of tripartite processes have realizations on time delocalized systems. So uh, this, uh, this proof had been established before for uh, unitary extensions of bipartite uh, processes. And now uh, in this work, we generalize it to unitary extensions of tripartite processes. So uh, this is uh, again uh, some particular class of uh, of tripartite processes, and for which one can uh, one can uh, one can do the, the the same argument. So one can uh, come up with some temporal uh, circuit, which uh, is such that when uh, it is described in terms of uh, some choice of new time delocalized systems looks precisely like the, the process matrix. So the, uh, the structure one has uh, in the process matrix framework. So uh, for, for this proof uh, to, to construct the temporal circuit, one uh, uses precisely this fact that I, I mentioned before that all uh, bipartite processes uh, with a unitary extension are variations of the quantum switch. So that means for any uh, tripartite uh, unitary uh, extension of a tripartite process, one can find such a variation of the quantum switch where uh, UA and UB act uh, like in the quantum switch on some uh, target system coherently controlled by some control system and which is composed of circuit operations that depend on the third operation, which would be UC here. So this uh, on, on the right here would be the temporal circuit that one starts from and then one can show that one can, uh, in this temporal circuit, identify some suitable time delocalized input and output systems, such that when one uh, makes this change to the uh, description in terms of these new systems, again, one decomposes the circuit into certain fragments and uh, composes it with, uh, so the red one with some isomorphisms and the blue one with some inverse isomorphisms that define the new systems. And then uh, one obtains again, precisely a cyclic circuit as in the process matrix framework. So uh, again, the, the main technical result is that uh, for any unitary extension of a tripartite circuit, one can find some uh, temporal circuit, which when one describes it in terms of new subsystems, looks precisely like uh, what one has in the process matrix picture. So in that sense, it's a realization on the process since it uh, happens on these uh, alternative systems that we can choose to describe the circuit. So uh, this uh, 
result for the tripartite case is particularly interesting because uh, in the tripartite case, uh, contrary to the bipartite case, we know that there exist process matrices that have a unitary extension and that violate causal inequalities. So uh, there is an, uh, an example of a tripartite process, which uh, was uh, introduced by uh, Baumüller uh, and uh, Wolf, and uh, which is particularly interesting because it describes a classical process. So it is, um, it is diagonal in the computational basis, and therefore it can be interpreted as a, a purely classical process. And uh, so this process violates causal inequalities and it has indeed a, a unitary extension. So uh, one can now uh, apply this uh, result for the general tripartite case to this, uh, to this particular uh, example of a process and uh, what one would obtain when one does this for the temporal circuit is something like that. So here uh, A and B act like in a quantum switch in a coherently uh, controlled way. So their uh, times of operations are coherently controlled by a control system. But for, uh, for the third operation, uh, you see the situation is different. So it is uh, applied once with certainty in the beginning and then uh, at some later time after UA and UB have been applied, it can be uh, reversed and reapplied. And whether that happens or not depends on uh, what uh, what UA and, and UB do. So uh, one, uh, one might think that one has here several instances of UC, but uh, again, this uh, you see uh, when, when one moves to this uh, perspective in terms of uh, time delocalized systems, you see uh, acts uh, precisely once and only once, like also a UA and UB, and everything looks precisely like in the process matrix picture. And so uh, what is uh, also uh, interesting about this circuit is that uh, basically all, all operations just, uh, so, so one can take a UA and UB also to be, uh, and, and you see also to be, to be classical operations, so, uh, just to be operations that map computational basis states to computational basis states. And uh, the same is also true for the uh, operations in the circuit. So uh, that means that uh, one can understand all that purely in terms of classical uh, variables rather than quantum operations. And so one has a causal inequality violations with, with purely classical time delocalized variables, so to say, uh, rather than uh, time delocalized systems. So uh, now one, uh, one may wonder what, uh, what does this imply or what, uh, what does it mean that in such a situation uh, we can violate causal inequalities? What, uh, what, what can we learn from that? And uh, in particular, uh, one can look at the assumptions behind causal inequalities and study this uh, causal inequality violation uh, in light of the, the assumptions behind causal inequalities. So the uh, assumptions behind causal inequalities were for, first formulated in this uh, original paper that introduced the process matrix framework by uh, Reshkov, Costa and Bruckner. And they are that uh, one has a causal order. So the variables in the experiment are uh, so which are the settings, outcomes, and the incoming and outgoing variables of each party uh, occur in some well-defined causal order, which could uh, in general be uh, random and dynamical. And uh, that the settings of the parties are freely chosen. So uh, formally, this means that uh, they can only be uh, correlated with properties that pertain to their causal future. So for instance, the values of the of the variables in their causal future or the causal order of the, the variables in their future. And uh, the third assumption that goes into the derivation of causal inequalities is the closed laboratory assumption. So that means that one, uh, intuitively speaking, one uh, imagines these uh, local parties to uh, 
to act in some closed laboratory where they uh, receive a, a system and they open their laboratory just once to receive a system and once to send out the system. And formally, that means that uh, any information exchanged between the uh, outcomes of each party and the rest of the experiments needs to pass through the incoming, so what comes into the the lab of the uh, the, the incoming uh, system of the party and uh, vice versa for the, the settings and the uh, outgoing systems. And uh, also a second part is that the incoming system or variable in the classical case is in the closer past of the outgoing systems or variable. So these are the three assumptions that go into the uh, derivation of causal inequalities. And uh, what we do in our paper is that we formalize these assumptions for the multipartite case. So uh, first they were formulated in the in the bipartite case, and now we form formalize them for the multipartite case. And now the the question that one needs to consider in order to uh, to say whether this, this this causal inequality violation on time delocalized systems is uh, interesting or, or surprising is whether uh, these assumptions are such that one would naturally expect them to hold uh, in in such a setting with time uh, delocalized variables because if uh, or whether there's one assumption of which one can say that it's uh, manifestly violated and uh, so in, uh, in our paper, we argue that uh, this causal inequality violation uh, indeed shows something interesting because uh, the assumptions behind causal inequalities that we formulate are, uh, are well motivated. And we, we do so uh, based on the, uh, on the causal relations of the variables in the process. So one can uh, consider the causal relations between the uh, those time delocalized variables and uh, they form what is called a cyclic classical uh, split node causal model. So uh, the, there's this, this language of, uh, of causal models, which was related to the uh, process matrix framework in, in, uh, in this uh, paper by Barrett, uh, Lorenz and uh, Reshkov. And in particular, they study also this uh, tripartite example of a process that we considered from that perspective. And uh, so that uh, enables one to describe the causal relations in this process in uh, in a formal way. And uh, in uh, in such a realization uh, on time delocalized systems, these causal relations would actually be observable. So there uh, there is a way how one could intervene uh, on on these variables and actually observe that the causal relations are. Uh, or like that, like one would describe them in, in this framework of uh, cyclic uh, classical split node uh, causal models. And uh, then one can say that uh, based on these causal relations, one uh, could believe in the in the free choice and the closed laboratory assumptions that uh, that we formulated. So uh, since uh, in uh, in this causal model, the uh, setting variables are root nodes in the graph so they uh one uh, one could expect them to be freely chosen and uh, the uh, outgoing variable uh, screens off all all influences that come from from the setting uh, variable so uh, this is what one would have in the closed laboratory assumption and uh there's just one uh one subtlety what uh is uh, somewhat hard to to motivate from uh, from this picture of uh, of causal relations is the assumption that the uh, uh, incoming variable of the party is always in the outgoing variable of the party because this uh, might change depending on the setting of the party. So depending on what the party chooses as its setting, uh, this uh, one one could have an arrow from, uh, for instance, AI to AO or not and uh, so uh, but uh, what we know is that at least for for one value of the setting there always uh, is an arrow so um, one can always find a setting such that uh, there is an arrow and uh, in fact we show in the paper that even for with this uh, relaxation of the uh, 
of the cl uh, closed laboratory assumption, causal inequalities still hold. So uh, that uh, with that, we have some uh, some set of assumption that is uh, well motivated by the causal relations, the underlying causal relations between the uh, variables uh, in the process, and uh, that uh, for which uh, our causal inequality violation shows that uh, these uh, assumptions. Uh, so that uh, in uh, in that sense, the causal inequality violation is uh, is indeed something that's sort of surprising in the setting here and. Uh, a meaningful uh, witness of uh, the fact that uh, there is no explanation in terms of a definite causal order between these variables. So, uh, so let me sum up. Uh, so, uh, the main result of the talk is that, uh, contrary to what is believed, there are some particularly uh, extreme processes uh, with uh, indefinite causal order that can violate causal inequalities and that have a realization in a well-defined sense. So when one when one says that the process is supposed to have a realization in standard quantum theory, like for instance, it has been claimed for the quantum switch. One uh, one has to be precise about what this means, and uh, this time delocalized framework uh, is a, a way to do that. And when one uh, one does this, one finds that uh, indeed, in the sense, there are processes that violate causal inequalities, and that have such realizations. And uh, so, uh, open questions are about these uh, implications and what uh, what it means that uh, such uh, causal inequalities uh, violations are are possible. There's still a, a lot to to be understood. So uh, there's still a, a lot to be. Unraveled. So, uh, for instance, one might wonder whether uh, there are some other considerations which uh, might lead us to to drop one of the assumptions and to say that uh, one of the assumptions are violated, or one may ask the question whether uh, the some uh, something else in the picture has to be modified uh, somehow because uh, someone could say that uh, such uh, in, in in a way we we have some uh, well defined uh, explanation for. Uh, for how these uh, correlations come about, namely precisely this uh, this tripartite circuit, which uh, which uh, which I showed to you, which is uh, which is purely classical, and so someone could say uh, these uh, should should not be considered something that is non-causal because we have some well-defined uh, explanation for that, and one may wonder whether uh, somehow the concept of causal inequalities, for instance, could be modified or relaxed somehow to uh, to uh, take into account also these uh, situations, so they would not no longer be considered uh, non-causal. And then a uh, technical question is that we uh, had this uh, argument for tripartite processes, but one can wonder whether it can be generalized to other types of processes. And uh, one may also speculate about some links to quantum reference frames or a quantum equivalence principle. So uh, this uh, transformation of circuits to a new description in terms of different subsystems uh, reminds somehow of, uh, of reference frame transformations. And one can wonder whether something, whether this can be made more precise. And also one uh, can. Uh, Think about implications of this new perspective on time delocalized systems on uh, quantum information processing with indefinite causal structure, which is also one, one motivation to study uh, indefinite causal structure because it might lead to new advantages in quantum information processing. So that's all. Thank you, Julian. All right. Uh, there are no questions yet on the iPad, but, uh, okay. Questions from the audience. Uh, okay. Let's start with Carlo Maria. I actually have two questions. First of all, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, the first question is, do we know any, uh, process that violates the causal inequalities yet, uh, it doesn't admit 
a realization in terms of time delocalized systems. So in other words, could it be that all processes actually admit such a realizations? That could be, yes, we, we don't know. So don't. Uh, for, for instance, in the bipartite case, there is this initial example of a process matrix that was considered by Oreshkov, Costa and Hochner, which, uh, which violates causal inequalities, but which does not admit the unitary extension. So it does not fall under this, uh, this, uh, this theorem, and we, we don't know. It could still be that uh, it uh, it has some realization of time delocalized systems, but we don't know. So, uh, so okay. it's an open question. Thanks. And the second question is somehow related in the sense that uh, what's the role played by unitarity in this? So if you drop the unitarity assumption, because here you were considering a like unitary extension of processes, what happens? Are you, is it like more a technical requirement or do you think that there is something more fundamental yes, to that? It's a, it's a technical point. So uh, the fact that you have a unitary process means that you, you can decompose it in a, in a certain way. Namely, it has a, a decomposition where, uh, so, so if you consider this, uh, the, the unitary that describes the process, you can decompose it in a way uh, such that uh, the past system and all output systems are mapped to uh, the input system of one of the parties and its uh, output system is mapped uh, to uh, the uh, global future system and the input systems of all of the parties so you have this particular decomposition uh, in for for unitary processes and that's essential in the proof indeed so that's uh, what uh, allows you to establish this proof for uh, for unitary processes so that's a, a technical point that's... Uh... Okay, thank you very much. Hi, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, it's a really, really nice result. So I'm really impressed that you got this result. And uh, I want to say, so first of all, I like the fact that you've shown now how we can, how we can understand these kind of processes I mean, in a physical realization. So I, I, I like the fact that you, you can really say that, okay, I have implemented indefinite causal order in some sense in the laboratory based on this framework. But I would like to question um, a bit further whether this understanding of uh, indefinite causal order in the lab can be really seen as, as fundamental, in, in a fundamental sense, as the a, as a deepest description of nature, as opposed to just an effective description. So the question would be, um, let's say, uh, in the laboratory, you mentioned this the idea that some of the criticisms of the experiments have been related to the fact that you have, um, it, it looks like you have multiple uses of the same unitary gate. And physically what happens in the labs uh, most of the time is that when you're not using the unitary, let's say you have two uses in a quantum switch of some unitary, then when it's not being used in the other use, when you're not putting the particles through the other use, you have the vacuum. So it seems to me that the, the identification of the physical of, of the physical experiment with the time delocalized subsystem description relies on the fact that or relies on the assumption that the vacuum state is inaccessible to the experimenter. Um, whereas I'm I'm not completely convinced that this is that, that this um, assumption is, is always justified because it, it seems to me that in the most fundamental sense, um, the vacuum is part of the physical description and the quantum field theory, the vacuum is is just as uh, a fundamental fundamental state of the of the electromagnetic field as any other state. And if you do a, for example, you could do a Borgolubov transformation, and then the vacuum becomes a particle. So, I I, I would like to ask, um, in what sense is that assumption justified as a description of nature to really say that fundamentally nature exhibits an indefinite causal order in Minkowski spacetime, um, as opposed to just uh, an effective description of of um, transformations that you might want to do. Uh, yes, I would say uh, so. Uh, as long as you uh, you you'd accept this uh, this temporal description of uh, of the circuit, uh, like this uh, this temporal circuit that uh, that uh, describes the, the experiment of the quantum switch as a, a valid uh, description of the ex experiment, then uh, the uh, the time delocalized description. Uh, would also be a, a valid uh, description of the experiment. So it, uh, I I don't know if I would say that it's uh, necessarily more uh, more fundamental uh, or not, but it's a, also a possible description of the experiment, which uh, which allows you to make this link to the 
to the picture of uh, indefinite causal order. <laughs> Uh, so first, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have uh, so so I'm not sure I understood the the, dif the distinction between um, realization and simulation of indefinite causal order. Well, uh, I would say it's a it's a matter of terminology. So uh, some people have uh, have criticized uh, this uh, statement that. These things can be seen as realizations of uh, indefinite causal order, and uh, uh, in that debate, uh, these uh, these terms have been used. So whether it should be called a realization or a simulation of uh, indefinite causal order, and uh, so uh, yes, uh, as, uh, so uh, indeed, uh, if uh, if you want to say that's a realization, uh, then you you have to be precise about what. Uh, well, what what do you mean by that? And then uh, uh, that's that's why this time delocalized systems uh, framework was uh, was developed to to address this and to justify why they can uh, indeed be seen as realizations of uh, indefinite causal order. But, uh, but in the end, it's just uh, terminology. What you want to call realization or, or simulation? And uh, yeah, it's the terminology that has been used in in this context of this debate whether uh, to really be considered uh, genuine realizations of uh, indefinite causal order or not. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think uh, to some extent, Carlo Maria asked this already, but I didn't fully understand the answer. Um, do you have an example of a process matrix which is not realizable as uh, a time delocalized circuit? Uh, we don't uh, okay. know. It, it could be that all uh, process matrices are uh, at materializations on time delocalized systems. Okay, so your point was the the unitary extension is more restricted than so. So there are there are processes which don't have a unitary extension. Oh yes, and, and that that's yeah. that was your comment that, about that the OCD true, yeah. process. There are process right. matrices that do not admit the unitary extension because uh, so of course all uh channels can be dilated to a unitary but this unitary is then not guaranteed to be a a valid process matrix and uh indeed for some process matrices one can show that there is no possibility to to introduce a unitary extension such that it remains valid well, thanks a lot for the very interesting talk it's a really nice result and framework that you have so my question is also more related to the physical interpretation of this result and i think claire kind of put forward this point in a very clear way but just to add to that so for instance in the quantum switch in terms of um, these realizations where you can talk about it in terms of the vacuum state and so on there's a precise way to justify the closed lab assumption which is that each party acts once and only once right or well, one of the ways to justify that is using counters, for instance, and you could argue that in the realization of the quantum switch in the lab, um, these operations are applied once and only once to a non-vacuum state. Um, and for instance, in the and the reason this is sort of important that each operation acts once and only once is that um, in, in the process matrix description, this is what one has. And uh, in order to show that uh, say these indefinite causal structures have possibly some um, uh, advantages in information processing tasks and so on. We want to ensure that we actually query or apply each operation once. But in the circuit, for instance, you had on uh, slide 29, uh, if, if we, uh, um, so I'm just thinking out loud, if we try to add, say, counters to each operation to see how many times it's applied, um, it could seem as though this UC is, has to be applied twice because, as you said, the first time it's applied determinist deterministically and at the second time it's sort of applied depending on the action of the other parties, right? Um, how would you interpret that, for instance? It seems like this is a bit different than the quantum switch where we could argue that an operation acts once on a non-vacuum state. If you have any insights on that. Thank you. Uh, yes, so... Uh... In uh, in a way, this uh, time delocalized description is also a way of saying what what it means that an operation acts uh, once and only once. So here, uh, if uh, if for this circuit you you move to this uh, time delocalized description, uh, 
you uh, would find that with these specific systems uh, on uh, some specific uh, in systems CI and CO, it is applied uh, precisely once. In the lab, if you sort of add counters to count how many times it's actually applied, do you think this would give a different answer than the... Um, but yeah, perhaps we can discuss it later. All right. Uh, I think we should probably add and uh, have a break, um, but I will read you the question that I received in person. Maybe you can write an answer. All right, let's thank Julian again. <laughs>